Uh, so we, we've got a lot of questions that have uh, uh, come through from people. So uh, the first one is uh, from uh, Joe, who wants to know, on the subject of cultivation, is there a perfect chemotype profile in a cannabis cultivar for the most benefits regarding the entourage effect? Now, that's a lot of things that I don't understand there. Uh, for example, is there an ideal percentage of THC in relation to CBD and CBG? Well, that's why you've got to read the book. It's really complicated. And the, the reality is you've got to optimize the, the combination. There's very little research beyond the two main ingredients, THC and CBD. And we know different disorders respond better to different um, concentrations of them. And that's just one of the things I should perhaps say in terms of maybe you, if you need medical cannabis, it might be easier just to join the... Um, the Drug Science 2021 initiative, where we're making medical cannabis available at, a, at a pretty much a, a, a non-for-profit price. Uh, and then you can get a whole range. We've got high CBD, low THC, and high THC, low CBD. So it's a question of working out what the best ratio is for your particular disorder and for yourself. And in general, it's better to start with C high CBD because you won't get stoned rather than high THC, which you could, and then work towards the, you know, the middle place, depending on how you respond. And then whether, whether you add in other, um, other terpenes uh, in the entourage effect will also be determined by what you're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to achieve sleep, then you want a one that makes a lot of mercy. And if you're trying to have something that's a bit more activating, you want more linoline, et cetera. So, so you, can, you can, in theory, but whether actually you can achieve much in your own home growing it like that i don't know I'm, that's not a, not my expertise can i ask so the entourage effect then can you uh summarize what that so, means? yeah so it's the idea so so we're in the, the cannabis plant makes hundreds of chemicals some of which are cannabis like and others of which are not cannabis like but they're things like flavonoids they're like like things that are in all plants you know to give flavor and color etc okay and and some of them so the, the multitude, you heard in that question, they, they talked about a, a third cannabinoid, which is present cannabigerol. There are, that may have some activity. It's not present in large amounts, but it may have some activity to boost the effects of the main cannabinoids, which are cannabidiol and THC. But then the entourage effect is those multiple different cannabinoids and the other plant ingredients, which, you, which differ between different uh, strains of cannabis and uh, so the more sedating ones will have more myrcene and the less sedating ones will have more pinoline etc so you can you can adjust in theory you could you know you could actually fine-tune the effects you won't get massive uh, differences but you can fine-tune them by the different elements of the entourage in theory. Thank you. Uh, Michelle would like to know, is it true that cannabis can slow your reactions? Uh, there are many young drivers in our village and they're driving while smoking cannabis. Now you talk a little bit about this book so, in book, so it'd be interesting to know more about uh, your smoking and driving. Yeah, well, you know, you basically you shouldn't uh, drive if you've been intoxicated with anything. Um, as I like to say, the good thing about cannabis, by and large, people who take cannabis, they have two problems with driving. Very often they don't remember where they put the keys, so they can't go and drive at all. Uh, and secondly, when they're driving, they, they're usually conscious of the fact that they are impaired. So they tend to drive more cautiously. Unlike people who are drunk, who tend to think that they're a better driver when they're drunk. There's a really interesting paper published just, you know, I think um, last Friday from the States looking at the relationship between consumption of cannabis and driving performance. And there is, there is both no relationship between consumption or plasma levels and, um, and driving performance, which means that what we're doing at present by testing people for a concentration when they're stopped is actually um, likely to be penalizing people who aren't impaired at all. Uh, I'm actually very, angry with the government for, for using roadside cannabis testing as a way of punishing people for using cannabis which i think is is wrong it's you know it, the evidence that cannabis causes traffic accidents is very is borderline at the best clearly there are some people who have driven when stoned who have had, had accidents but regular users probably aren't that impaired and i think it's wrong to try to stop them using cannabis simply by doing roadside blood tests but obviously if you are impaired then um then don't drive.
Thank you. I hope that answered that for you, Michelle. Uh, Jonathan would like to know, what is your definition of skunk? Uh, is it yeah. just simply yet another strain? Well, yeah, I, I'm, I know the aficionados and the purists get angry with me. But I just, use, to be honest, I use skunk as a simple shorthand for high THC, 15% or more, or maybe 12 or more percent. THC containing cannabis that has very low CBD and the, and it so it doesn't have to smell like skunk to be skunk in my mind it's about strong THC which is bereft of the protective element that is offered by cannabidiol there is no doubt that the mixture of cannabidiol and THC equal equal concentrations produces less problems less intoxication less paranoia probably less psychosis, almost certainly less dependence than pure THC. And so the move from classical balanced cannabis to this sole uh, high strength THC, which I call skunk, that has caused most of the problems we see with cannabis today is because of skunk, because 95% of all cannabis sold in Britain is skunk. It's very hard to get the balanced mixture, which is another reason why it's critical that we roll out medical cannabis more widely, because we know a million people every day in Britain, maybe up to 1.5 million, are buying illegal cannabis to treat their medical problems. And what they're mostly getting is skunk, because that's mostly what's being sold. And much better if they get the right mixtures titrated according to their clinical needs. And you, you also talked about when, when that uh, cultivation increased in the UK about the uh, uh, blood cannabis, was it the uh, NSPCC kind of uh, some, some, some of the problems with, with some of the stuff that's being grown here. Is that right? Well, it, it's, well, I mean, certainly the, 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 the growing of cannabis in Britain has created enormous problems of young people being forced to work to cultivate illegal cannabis farms and then particularly the Vietnamese. So, you know, I mean, it, it, there's been a huge issue with, um, with you know, young Vietnamese boys being basically slaves in, in internal cannabis farms. I mean, it's, it's, it's disgusting. And, and, uh, and, and it, you know, it, it can easily be avoided simply by allowing it to be made and, you know, grown naturally under proper supervision and sold and, and taxed. I mean, just remember the reason, one of the reasons it, Colorado got through that was one that was the first one of the first states to get to get cannabis made legal is because they offered to put the first four billion of cannabis tax into education which to the to the Colorado population it was seemed like a really that's that kind of win-win we're not going to get arrested for smoking cannabis and our kids are getting educated from the, uh, the, the tax we pay. Uh, question from Naomi who would like to know uh, what is NCDA? <laughs> Sorry, the MCDA, multi-criteria decision analysis. It's a technique for evaluating. Oh, do you know what? It's, it says NCDA, so I presume that was another one, but we have done done that already, haven't we? So, but yeah, if you want to say it again anyway, just in case. So it's a it's a technique where when you're solving a problem, you look at every aspect of the problem. And one of the things I discovered, you know, in the, in the years of working with the government on drug policy, was that politicians prefer to have a simple single problem single solution it's bad ban it and what i in instigated was this technology for really evaluating the different harms of uh, of drugs ac across these 16 different criteria of harm and that's the most systematic way and it's been done by the way we've done it in britain uh the european um department of justice asked us to do it in europe we did we re replicated the one we did in britain um 30 European experts, 20 different countries. They changed every single ranking. They changed every single weighting and the results were identical. And then recently I've done it in Australia, same thing. But in Australia is very interesting because the one thing that changed in Australia, Australia has a big crystal meth problem. And it showed, in fact, in Australia, crystal meth came up alongside alcohol as a big problem, which shows that the methodology is actually sensitive to local needs. If there's a lot of crystal meth, it'll be more of a problem than if there's little in Britain, as in Britain. Thank you. I hope that uh, helped, Naomi. And then Tony would like to know, would cannabis help someone with chronic neuropathic pain? Uh, if so, uh, what would you recommend that they, or how would you recommend they should get access to it? Oh, yeah, well, of course. Actually, we just a few months ago published a, a really nice paper 
comparing all the different treatments for neuropathic pain. And what came out top was a combination of THC and cannabidiol. Uh, and that came out top for two reasons, because it was way more tolerable and preferable and gave a much better quality of life than any of the other treatments such as opioids or antidepressants. And, uh, and because it was pretty good for the pain too. So the, so the, the side effect burden was less and it was um, not as effective perhaps as one or two of the antidepressants, but it was the net health benefits or the well-being benefits were, were, were considerable. So you can read that paper that's on the drug science website, but also 50% of all the people in the 2021 treatment initiative have chronic pain. And we're finding really spectacular results. So just go onto the drug science website. You can log on, you can register, you can talk to a, a specialist and if uh, appropriate, which it probably is, you can get um, prescribed medical cannabis. And uh, not a question, but Sandy would just like to say thank you for uh, Sandy's qualified counsellor and uh, this has been very useful uh, and your other work in terms of education on uh, um, alcohol and drugs uh, and the kind of combatant to a lot of what you've seen in the media. Um, Katrina, we've talked a little bit about this, maybe we could talk more, but uh, in terms of cannabis helping with sleep issues when melatonin won't work. Yes, yes. Um... Melatonin tends not to work in people under the age of about 50, whereas cannabis does work across, uh, across the board. Um, so because so many people report that cannabis helps their sleep, uh, in our uh, trial, the 2021 initiative, we now have over 2,000 patients who are being given a prescribed medical cannabis, and, and we're rating sleep on all of them. So we have probably the biggest database on sleep and cannabis there's ever been. And it is quite interesting how cannabis overall tends to promote sleep. But different forms of cannabis have slightly different sleep promoting effects. The best experience, I think, is a balanced mixture of CBD and THC. Some people find a little, that may be a little bit too much THC. So we usually start with a more cannabidiol and less THC. But somewhere in that range, most people will get some sleep benefit. So again, if you've got a sleep problem, um, you, you could you know, log on to 2021 and, and, and talk to a specialist. Uh, Emma would like to know about cannabis's effect on memory and learning, what we know about that. Yes, well, what we know is a lot less than what people think they know. So, I mean, one of the saddest things of all is the, the way some scientists have tried to support the continued prohibition of cannabis by finding evidence that cannabis damages the brain or impairs performance or screws your memory, et cetera. Some of the science on cannabis and cognition is very, very bad. It's scaremongering and it's politically driven. So when journalists ring me, they used to ring quite often. I used to get a, a couple of weeks journalists. They don't do it anymore because I think they've all learned now that it doesn't make sense, but they'd ring and say, look, there's another paper here showing that cannabis produces this change in brain structure and this change in brain uh, function. And I would say, well, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? But by the way, you know, the only drug, and we have studied a lot of drugs, the only drug I could show brain images to you of that damages the brain is alcohol. And you should put the phone down then. And, and you, there were extraordinary contortions that journalists would go through. You say, well, look, you, they'd read a paper and they say, look, it impairs cognition. You say, but look, the brain's bigger here. And they say, well, that doesn't matter. Say, well, I, you know, surely if, you know, you're actually, you've got, the brain seems healthier and now you're, you know, you're worried about this small change. And overall, it's been very much a case of people trawling, dredging up something negative to find if, uh, in order to justify publishing a paper that says cannabis is bad. So it's, most of it's been driven. And yet people have to understand that until very recently, almost all the money that the American government spent on drug research, which is like, three quarters of all the money spent on drug research in the whole world, maybe more, could only be spent to find drugs were harmful. So it's not surprising people were churning out data claiming the drug was harmful. So the reality is, yeah, if you're stoned all the time, you're probably not going to be as good an accountant if you're not. You might be a better painter, though. I don't know. <laughs> Do you have problems in terms of getting research or are there enough, you know, kind of institutions that know that this is, you know, a, 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 an interesting direction to go in now an important one. Oh no there's very little funding for research really i mean it's it and that the problem is and this is it cuts i've talked sort of about this earlier 
in Britain, we kind of feel that the drug companies need to do the research. And uh, if the drug companies aren't doing the research, who's going to do it? So one of the reasons I set up 2021, which is this initiative, got 2,000 people in now, um, two years ago, was because I had a conversation with the Department of Health. And I said, well, look, these, um, we've got these kids with epilepsy, and adults with epilepsy, you know, they, they believe cannabis helps them. Um, we ought to be studying them. I want to study them. And they said, oh, we're going to study them. We're going, don't worry, we're going to set up a study. Uh, um, three years later, they haven't actually even started the study. And I find that reprehensible. So I'm really glad we kicked it off. The uh, um, Maggie would like to know, what about this CBD of various strengths that is very popular from all health shops? Does this yes. So CBD is that we're one of the one thing we didn't give in to the Americans with was banning CBD. Most countries in the world thought that CBD, because it started off as canna, was cannabis. So most countries CBD was banned. But the British scientists back in 1971 said, well, it's not psychoactive, so we'll keep it alive. Now, no one knew that until a few years ago when people started realizing you could get CBD and you could sell it because it was legal in Britain. And it's uh, as long as it hasn't got any THC in, it's legal to sell. Is it useful? Yeah. So it's, uh, there's, it's, uh, there's a medicine now called Epidiolex, which is a, a medicine for some children with epilepsy. It's not as good as medical cannabis for, for many of them, but it, it is an anti-epileptic. It is an anxiolytic. You can use it. Um, you know, people rub it on their skin. People make all sorts of claims about it. Um, the, the reality is most of what you buy over the counter in, in health food shops is a concentration of less, you're taking less than about 10 milligrams a day, which is probably of relatively little value. I mean, I can't say it has zero value. It may be a bit like microdosing psychedelics. It might have some value, but uh, um, it's unlikely to be problematic as well. So I suppose if you find it helpful, and, you, and then, you know, there's no reason not to use it. But for most medical purposes, so you might have heard, well, no, you'll hear tomorrow, the press release went out today. We are, tomorrow, we, we are starting formally a trial of cannabidiol in long COVID. And um, because we think it, it could help with some of the, some of the symptoms. And there we're, we're at least, we're, we're targeting a 50 milligram dose, because we think unless you get to about 50 milligrams a day, you're probably not getting much interaction with the brain uh, cannabis receptors that you want to target. Uh, Katrina uh, would like to know, she said, uh, I'm in my 70s and I've never tried cannabis. What can it offer people in old age? Well, I can say it's in Israel. It is now the um, standard treatment for old people who are struggling to sleep. They don't give them sleeping pills anymore. They don't give them melatonin anymore. They just give them uh, either cannabis drops or let them smoke on a toke. So all I suggest you do, though, if you're going to use that, I think you probably, I wouldn't go out scoring it yourself if I were you, if you're 70. I think you might be a bit vulnerable. I think you might, you might need to find someone to get it for you. Or you could just buy the CBD illegally and, um, and try that. That might help. Uh, and George just, uh, George says uh, he's found great success with prescribed high THC cannabis flower for treating ADHD and used it throughout the workday, but still fears the stigma if work colleagues smelt it on him or found out. Do you have any advice on how to respond to potential raised eyebrows from friends, families or colleagues? Yeah, no, it's really important. So you need to show them your prescription. Although there was a terrible case just last month when a man with a prescription of cannabis was arrested and held in cells for 24 hours because the police didn't believe it was a medicine. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of find it bizarre that after it's been a medicine for three years, I mean, the police. So the answer is you need, it's education. It's making sure you, if I, and, and if you, I would carry your prescription with you all the time in case someone, what, police dogs can sniff you. They don't allow, they're not allowed to search you, of course, if there's dogs sniff, but they, you know, you may be forced to be searched. If the police you know, come across you, you just have to emphasize you've got a prescription. There's also a card you can carry called the CAN card, which you can get, which also is endorsed by your GP, which will also help basically justify your, your statement that this is a medical prescription. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we didn't get through all the questions. I knew there'd be a lot tonight. Uh, cannabis seeing through the smoke is, uh, I just, just read that day, it's filled with really, uh, as, again, as I said at the beginning, that 
evidence-based thinking stuff that you can properly just you can check and you can find the reports and you can do and that's why you know never trust a book without any footnotes is one of the things i think with it in science but there's a lot of places you can go if you want to find out more from this uh david thank you so much and just a reminder again your character uh, of how people can find out more about the uh, the charity drug science yeah just on the website just type in drug science and uh, you'll go onto the website and then you can find how you can register to get an assess for medical cannabis and you can also read all our papers on medical cannabis and you can listen to my podcasts and and you can you know support the charity as well if you like brilliant thank you so much david and thank you to luke as well uh, who produced tonight's show and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon have a lovely evening <laughs>